Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to be discussing cleft orthodontics. And uh, we're going to dive right in with the outline, starting with introduction, prevalence, effects of cleft lip and palate, the cleft team, the role of the orthodontists, the aims of surgic of orthodontic treatment, stages of orthodontic treatment, challenges, moving forward, and conclusions. Now, cleft lip and palate is the most frequently occurring congenital anomaly. And the, depending on the extent of the defects that the patient is born with, they can face a number of complex problems dealing with facial appearance, feeding, airway, hearing, growth, and speech. Now, some of these problems are intrinsic, which are related to the cleft deformity itself, whereas others are secondary to the surgical intervention that are, uh, is performed to repair either the lip, the nose, the alveolus, or the palatal defect. These problems may reflect on the severity of the initial surgeon. So basically what we're saying is that how well or poorly the initial surgery carried out is will have a direct response to the growth of the patient and the ease or the difficulty to which the orthodontic will face its management. For the uninitiated, we'll start with who is an orthodontist. An orthodontist is a dental specialist who deals with the growth and development of the jaws and their relationship to each other, as well as the alignment or malalignment of the teeth within the dental arches. Historically, the orthodontist has been a member of the cleft team since the inception of cleft teams. So they have been busy with the management of the cleft lip and palate patient for over 80 years. And in no other realm of orthodontic treatment are we inextricably tied to the oral surgeon in terms of outcomes. So if, you have, if we have a good surgical outcome, our treatment is easy. And if we have a poor surgical outcome, it makes our treatment much more difficult. Now, um, cleft lip and palate is known to be a global problem, occurring in one in 700 patients worldwide, live births worldwide, worldwide, but it's least common in blacks. Now, the prevalence has reported to occur from one in 978 to one in 2,703 amongst the Nigerian population. Um, the Tadley et al have noted that unilateral cleft lip and palate are the most prevalent cleft anomalies seen in this part of the world, with bilateral clefts occurring in 14.3%. There's a predominance for males, male occurrence, and also left-sided clefts. Whereas with, uh, unilater with cleft palate only is seen most frequently in females. Again, we are harping on the intrinsic and the cleft and the surgical effects of cleft lip and palate. They are skeletal, dental, occlusal, and soft tissue effects. We're going to start with skeletal. There's an overall decrease in the size of the maxilla, and that is three dimensionally. So we are talking transversely, anteroposteriorly and vertically. And this often results in mid face retrusion of the cleft patient. Contrarily, the gonial angle is increased in such patients because of the position of the tongue, which is low lying. Now in the, in the bilateral cleft lip and palate, there is an overgrowth. There tends to be an overgrowth in the vomero premaxillary suture. And this results in premaxillary protrusion in the young bilateral cleft lip and palate and vertical excess of the premaxilla in, in the bilateral cleft lip and palate along the ages. So basically at the end, we find a patient with reduced upper facial height and increased lower facial height. 
Now, the dental effects tend to uh, affect the maxillary lateral most commonly. And this often presents as malformed, diminutive, or peg shaped. Supernumerary teeth may also be seen in these patients, but it's most frequently, more frequently seen in the primary dentition. Hypodontia of the lateral incisor is most uh, commonly seen. However, it may occur in other teeth. But in the lateral incisor, more than 50% of patients may present with a missing lateral incisor, either on the cleft side or on both sides of the upper arch. Ectopic eruption and impaction is also a common... Ectopic eruption or impaction is also commonly seen. 20% of canine impactions are seen in cleft patients. Rotation of central incisor on the cleft side, hypoplastic incisors, prolonged retention of the primary dentition are also frequent occurrences in the cleft patient. Many cleft patients have been shown to present with delayed eruption of teeth up to one year, nine months to one year in when compared to non-cleft patients. And there has been shown to be an overall reduction in cleft size. Now the occlusal effects involve class three incisal relationship and there tends to be a centerline shift towards the cleft side. There's buccal cross bites and this is, occurs more severely also on the cleft side. Anterior open bite or mandibular overclosure is frequently seen whereas crowding and deep bite are also present in these patients. Soft tissue effects include lip tension, maxillary ankylosis, and low tongue posture. And apart from all these effects, it also affects, as you know, hearing and speech. Now, in terms of care of the cleft patient, it's a well-known fact that comprehensive management of the cleft patient is the best way to go. And as a result, there has been the development of the multidisciplinary cleft team since the 1940s. Now the cleft team is responsible for providing comprehensive care of the cleft patient with each specialist bringing his expertise to the patient for the best possible outcome. Smile Train, we thank you has played a very large role in the development of cleft teams throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Now this is a diagram that just goes to show just how extensive the cleft team can be. We may not be able to achieve this large a group, but we, it is very important to have the very important members or specialists within our cleft team. What is the role of us as an orthodontist? We deal with the malocclusion and malalignment of teeth and of course we've said it's a growth related problem and that is part of our job. So it requires, we are required to collaborate very closely with other team members. We see the uh, cleft child as soon as the child is born and we continue to review that child's facial growth and occlusal development throughout the period of its growth. It's our job to make those critical decisions for orthodontic intervention at each appropriate stage. Uh, this is just a slide showing the timeline which, is given, which has been given to us by Smile Train, and you can see using, um, you can see all the highlighted areas where the orthodontist comes in. So the orthodontist starts at birth and he see, sees the cleft patient right through till adulthood. The goals of orthodontic treatment include the improvement of aesthetics, improvement of health and function, we help to eliminate the need for surgical or major prosthesis. 
And last but not least, we improve their self-esteem. Changing lives by creating beautiful smiles. There are four distinct developmental periods during which we see the cleft patients. And we start with um, neonatal and infancy, in which we carry out pre-surgical infant orthopedics. We have primary dentition, mixed dentition stage, permanent dentition stage. These are just a couple of the patients. Now, starting with neonatal and infancy. Management of the patients at this stage is controversial. Not everybody believes that it is necessary, but it is used in many, in many centers prior to lip surgery. It's carried out shortly after birth and is usually indicated in very wide clefts and cases of bilateral cleft lip and palate with protrusion of the premaxilla. The um, we also, in some centers, it doesn't happen very frequently anymore, carry out primary alveolar bone grafting. And we have a number of appliances which we use. Now, some of the appliances include feeding plates, pre-surgical nasal alveolar molding and appliance, otherwise known as the NAM, and that is how I refer to it as, the Latham appliance, the Figueroa appliance, and strapping. Now, the concept of molding cartilage was first performed by Matsuo in 1984. He, re he recognized that the cartilage of newborn is quite soft and it lacks elasticity due to the high levels of maternal estrogen at birth, and therefore that makes it very moldable. And the goal at this stage is just to simplify surgical repair of the lip and to eliminate the need for orthodontic treatment after primary teeth have erupted. Basically, we're trying to align the arches as well as approximate the lip to make surgery much easier for the patient. We're going to start with, just deal with two of the appliances that we use at this stage. And the first one is going to be the nasal alveolar molding appliance or the NAM, which was designed by Grayson in the 1990s and its job was basically to prepare the child for stage one, for one stage primary lip and nose repair. It consists of two components, the intraoral component or the molding plate and the nasal component which is referred to as the nasal stent. Now the goals of this appliance is basically to align the intraalveolar segments to approximate the lip seal, to correct the nasal tip and the ala base on the affected side. So we're trying to give that flattened area of the nose a bit of a dome and reduce the size of the ala base. In addition, we are trying to center the columella and in cases of bilateral cleft lip and palate, we also lengthen the columella. Uh, this is the procedure. We're going to go by this little by little, starting with starting with the taking of a polyvinyl C siloxane impression using a custom tray. From this, we now get a working model in dental stone. From the working model, the first appliance is made. This is the intraoral molding plate. And once the patient cleft diameter reduces, or cleft width reduces to less than five millimeters, we now include the nasal stent. The nasal stent has an acrylic bulb, and this acrylic bulb goes into the ala of the nose and raises it. Now this one, the one at the top is used for the a unilateral cleft lip and palate patient, whereas the lower one is used in a bilateral cleft lip and patient. 
cleft lip and palate patient. Now we're going to go through the stages of the nasal alveolar molding very quickly. We start with the we start with the um, We start with the initial intraoral molding plates, which is a shell of hard acrylic. And we have gradual increments of soft tissue dental liner. And you can see the pink. I'm not sure if my beam is showing. There's a pink mark showing the addition of the soft tissue dental liner. And what we gradually do is with 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter increments, we gradually mold and move the arches. Contrarily, where the direction in which you want the arch to move or the uh, cleft segment to move, you remove acrylic. So acrylic is being removed from the, from the intraoral appliance and it's being added and soft tissue, the, um, soft tissue dental liner is being added to a place mild force and to guide the segments in the direction that you want them to go. So this is done gradually until you get the cleft width down to less than five millimeters. When you get them down to less than five millimeters, you now include nasal stent and once the nasal stent is added then the nose the changes that are required from the nose now come about um, this is a diagram courtesy of dr deji fashimo a colleague in the us we have not yet started doing this in our country um, in our center, I think they're doing it in Kano. And we start with a very large unilateral cleft lip and palette. The appliance number two has been put in. Then, by the time that cleft width is markedly reduced, we now include, as you can see in picture four, the nasal stent so with the acrylic bulb it's very smooth and it's not painful to the child and this is a picture of the child at the end of surgery so you can see that the columella is a good length and it has been centered and you can see that it's not the dome is raised it's not flattened and the ala is not wide at all getting back home were good old strapping. Useful, this is a patient that it has bilateral cleft lip and palate and premaxillary prominence. So we use this appliance, use strapping for this patient. And you have to take into consideration, you really have to select patients that apart from needing um, the um, PSIO, also is ready to do the work that goes with it. So this is the patient at the end of treatment. Same thing, strapping of a patient that had unilateral cleft lip and palate. She had a wide unilateral cleft lip and palate and we managed to reduce it. So the last picture shows her just before she went for surgery. So what are the advantages of carrying out this at a child so young? It's believed to facilitate feeding because it actually covers the clefts of the palates. It's believed to guide the growth and development of the maxillary segment by contouring them. And this also helps to normalize tongue function. It facilitates surgery, improves, believes, it's been believed to help to improve speech, and it has a positive psychological effect on the parents in that the parents many of them want to be seen to be doing something for this child. The disadvantages and what makes it often very controversial is that 
it's not cost effective because it has no long-term benefits. The only thing that, of the only part of this treatment that has a long-term effect is the effect on the nose. And it, studies have shown that there are no advantages over patients that did not undergo pre-surgical orthodontics. Going on to the primary dentition, this was very popular in the 1930s and 1940s, but it is no longer really carried out. Most of the time we try to delay treatment to the mixed dentition stage. Patients that have habits, we will um, apply habit breakers and we will only manage patients that have very severe functional effects that might be having a psychological effect on the patient. By the time we get to the mixed dentition stage, and this is from seven to 12 years of age, we get very busy. The orthodontist gets very busy. So we're preparing the patient for um, alveolar bone graft. We're correcting anterior and posterior crossbites, anterior rotations. We're expanding the arch. We are eliminating any traumatic occlusion. And in patients that present with deficient maxillary or maxillary hypoplasia, we are carrying out face mask therapy or bone anchored maxillary protraction. This is a young girl that presented at the age of nine. She had a habit, hence the, hence the anterior open bite. And the first thing we did was to break the habit. While breaking the habit, she had a rotation on the cleft side, which is very frequently seen in such patients. We attempted, I attempted to derotate the tooth before placing an appliance in her mouth. So later on, we placed the appliance, managed to close the open bite, and the patient went on to the next stage of treatment. One of the key procedures that we carry out in the mixed dentation stage is expansion of the arches. So why are we expanding? It's basically to align the collapsed arches. It also helps to correct posterior cross bites, which are frequently seen in patients, especially when they have uh, clefts of the palate. You are preparing the patient by creating space for alveolar bone grafting. It improves airway dimensions and it also prepares the patients that require maxillary protection for this procedure. Now expansion can be either rapid or slow. Rapid uses the hyrax or the fan-shaped expander, whereas slow utilizes the quad helix, night eye expander or upper removable appliances. And this expansion is usually carried out before alveolar bone grafting. So these are a few appliances. We have the quad helix, or if we have a very narrow arch, we might reduce it to a tri-helix. Then in the lower right-hand corner, in the lower left-hand corner, we have the Orphan expander, which is a rapid palatal expander, and which uh, that produces asymmetric expansion. And a slow expander, the night eye expander, nickel titanium. It's a very gentle appliance. Now, this is a patient that underwent rapid palatal expansion. On the left, you can see the appliance on fitting and at the end of treatment. And in the lower portion, you can see the patient when she was finally fitted with um, orthodontic fixed appliances and the arch was contoured. Now, once finishing expansion, it is very important to stabilize because if you don't stabilize, then the arches will collapse. Uh, a fixed stabilizer is very useful. The extended uh, transpalatal arch, and it has the advantage of your being able to keep it in the mouth. If you make it a little bit shorter, you can keep it in the mouth even when the patient goes for alveolar bone grafting. So it can maintain what you have achieved. Now, in terms of protraction, 
the protraction face mask is a very commonly used appliance. And it's used, as I said before, in patients that have hypoplasia, maxillary hypoplasia. Now, you commence management of patients that require protraction with expansion. And then the patient is fitted with a protraction mask. So in the picture below, you can see the expander. There's a rapid palatal expander in the patient's mouth. And once you have satisfactorily expanded the arch, you can now start applying orthopedic feed forces. Now this rapid palatal expansion actually loosens the circummaxillary sutures and makes protraction a lot easier. So applying very heavy forces up to 18 ounce extraoral elastics, you cause an increase in growth at the circummaxillary sutures. Now uh, this is a young girl who is wearing a protraction face mask. You can see the elastics on either side, which are attached to hooks within the appliance. And this is worn for a number of months until you achieve the positive overjet that you're trying to achieve. Now, another form of protracting the maxilla is using the bone anchored maxillary protraction. And this is done, carried out using bony plates, bony mini plates. They're attached in the maxilla to the infrazygomatic crest and in the mandible, they are attached just between the lateral and the canines. And you use a force of about 250 milligrams in order to cause a correction of the reverse overjet. So it can protract the maxilla up to seven millimeters in one year. And it's actually been found to be more effective than the protraction face mask. I think it would be good for us to do it in this part of the world because we are uh, social beings and wearing the protraction face mask might cause problems for the cleft patients. It might make them uncomfortable and it might make them embarrassed. These are inside the mouth and nobody's going to see it unless they open their mouths. Now, um, alveolar bone grafting has been well explained by uh, Dr. Akintu Bobo. So I'm not going to go into it too much, except for to say that there's primary, secondary, tertiary. Primary, I've already said that we don't do that so much anymore. Secondary is what we do in mixed dentition stage, and this is the best period at which to carry it out. Usually the canine is about half formed at the time you're carrying out this over alveolar bone grafting. So you're timing it so that the canine can actually erupt into the alveolar bone graft. And this provides stress the eruption of the canine provides a functional load on the newly grafted bone, so it increases the graft take. Now in late secondary or tertiary bone grafting, the canine has already erupted and you find out that it's less sex successful because there's less stress placed on the graft. So stress is good in this case. Again, the only thing I want you to take home for, for us as orthodontists is that Alveolar bone grafting helps us to connect the two segments of the arch or the three segments of the arch, so it stabilizes the arch for us. And it also prepares the patient for prosthodontic wear if and when they need it. Teeth can also be moved into the alveolar bone graft as and when necessary. So this is just a periapical radiograph or two periapical radiographs showing the patient before alveolar bone grafting and after alveolar bone grafting. Now, a lot of patients in this part of the world present themselves to us for the first time in complete permanent dentition. Either adolescents that are in complete permanent dentition or adults. 
So these patients often present with a concave profile and a skeletal free pattern. We note that once again, there is deficiency in all three planes, anteroposterior, transverse, and vertical. Teeth try to compensate. There are lingually inclined incisors due to the pressure coming from repaired lift, the repaired lip. There's also, as I mentioned before, midline shift to the cleft side, anterior open bite or mandibular overclosure. So this is the period for comprehensive orthodontics. So this is the period where the patient is going to be placed on full fixed orthodontic appliance wear. Now we're going to discuss our management by categorizing it into three types. Number one, where there's no skeletal discrepancy. Two, where there's a mild skeletal discrepancy. And number three, where there's a moderate to severe skeletal discrepancy. So we're going to start with patients that have no skeletal deformity. And these usually include patients that have isolated cleft lip and alveolus or clefts of the soft palate. The management tends not to differ much from what a normal non-cleft patient requires. We're correcting rotations. We are possibly expanding the arch, but we're not doing any serious expansion. So we can use either a quad helix or we can use just the arch wire to correct these cross bites. We can also advise, advance the um, incisors in cross bites utilizing arch wire. Again, nothing serious is required. And then we decide once if alveolar bone grafting has been carried out, they, we now decide whether we're going to close the space for a possibly missing lateral incisor or we're going to open it up. So this is a young girl who presented at the age of 23. She hadn't had her repair. She went back and had her repair of her palate, which constricted her arch further. This is um, her towards the end of treatment. She actually had seven premolars congenitally absent. So she was a challenge, but it's a challenge we enjoyed. Now, at this stage, we're still dealing with patients that have no skeletal deformity. We need to decide whether we want to replace it. If it's at, replace the lateral incisor if it's missing with a removable uh, prosthesis, or we can later on, if we are seeing, if we're looking at an adult, have the patient given a, a dental implant or a bridge once growth has ceased. Most of the work is going to be done by the prosthodontist or the restorative uh, dentists. If we opt to close the space of the lateral incisor, we may end up finishing up the patient with a class two molar relationship. Now going on to patients that have mild skeletal deficiencies, and this is something that we probably tend to target. If we cannot get no deficiency, it would be nice to get just a mild skeletal deficiency. And this usually requires orthodontic camouflage. And you camouflage by putting in dental compensation. So you're proclining the upper incisors, you're retroclining the lower incisors, so you can get an adequate overjet. You're correcting rotations when present. And just like with um, cases of no skeletal deficiency, you are opening or closing spaces of missing teeth. By the time you're dealing with a patient that has moderate to severe skeletal discrepancy, you are not working alone. You have to, your best results can only be brought about by working in combination with the oral surgeon. So what is usually required is orthodontic treatment and then carefully co um, coordinated orthognathic surgery or distraction osteogenesis. So depending, if you are carrying out orthognathic surgery, it depends on how severe 
the patient's reverse overjetties. If there's a discrepancy between the upper and lower arch of more than 10 millimeters, you may have to both protract the maxilla and, and, and retract the mandible. However, if it's less than that, you can usually get away with just the mandibular advancement. Orthodontic treatment in such patients that require orthodontic surgery actually has to be done once maturity has been obtained. So growth has to have ceased before they can undergo orthognathic surgery. It is our job as orthodontists to see the patient before surgery and after surgery. Now I'm going to briefly talk about distraction osteogenesis because I realize that nothing's coming up on it and smile train does not allow us to carry out orthognathic surgery. So what we have left to us is the use of distraction osteogenesis in patients that have this type of discrepancy. So distraction osteogenesis can be carried out in adolescents and they can also be carried out in adults. That's the beauty of it. And it has the advantages of generating new bone at the osteotomy site. You can make very large advances of the maxilla without the need for any bone grafting and you also expand the soft tissue as well and you when you take into consideration we have scarring in the soft tissues distraction osteogenesis actually looks quite nice now i don't want to get too much into i'm not an oral surgeon so i don't want to get too much into the distraction procedure but enough to say that once the osteotomy has been performed in the maxilla, there's a five day latency period. You activate the appliance, which may be internal or external, one millimeter per day until you achieve what? The position that you want the teeth to be. So you reach, once you've achieved the overject you want to achieve, you now stop and allow what you have achieved to consolidate for a minimum of eight weeks. Once that has happened, you are now going to continue with your orthodontic management. Now, these diagrams are just showing two types of um, distraction appliances, the internal on your left and the external on your right. The internal is actually very useful because in this part of the world we really don't have funds as such and this internal distractor is actually a hyrax appliance which is turned 90 degrees to bring about anteroposterior distraction so once that has been it can up to 14 millimeters worth of protraction can be achieved using this appliance the rigid external device which is on the on the right has the advantage of allowing for both forward and downward movements whereas the internal will only move horizontally that is forward and you actually have to use internal elastics to bring about that downward vector that you need this is a patient that is about ready to proceed with her distraction she started up as she as you can see her in the top left hand corner and this is where she is now currently we are creating space between the four and the five so that we can make anterior lefort one osteotomy cuts So going back to orthognathic surgery, like I said, we're not really allowed to do it, but at least one should have an idea of what it's about. So the 4 one seems to be the most common osteotomy done in the maxilla, whereas there are, op there are a, a variety of options in the mandible to set the mandible back in cases where 
there's a negative overjet exceeding 10 millimeters. You cannot move the maxilla forward more than that. And this, small, this diagram basically tells us how we're going to deal with the patient. So whether the patient is a distraction case or the patient is um, an orthopedic straight, the orthos, orthodontist and the oral surgeon have to come together. The oral surgeon or the plastic surgeon have to come together and evaluate the patient. The patient is now sent to us. You come to an agreement. The patient is now sent to the orthodontist who spends about 12 to 18 months, it's usually longer in the cleft patients, to undergo pre-surgical orthodontists. And in that, in that period, we're decompensating, we're aligning, we're leveling the arches, and we're coordinating the arches in preparation for surgery. Surgery is now carried out, and she comes back, he or she comes back to us to undergo post-surgical orthodontics, whereby we do our final detailing. You're not going to get a perfect finish just with surgery, so our job as orthodontists is now to do the final detailing and settle the teeth so that they're interdigitating well and the patient has a good bite and a very good smile. Following treatment, retention has to be carried out. You can't just let the patient go, go away without holding what you've achieved, especially the expansion. Now, um, appliances that can be used for retention in the cleft patient are holy retainers, soldered lingual arches, or fixed lingual retainers. You need to have a rigid retainer. You cannot use what we commonly use as orthodontists for orthodontic retention, and that is our Essex retainers, because they're too flexible and the arches will collapse using that kind of appliance. So the best type of appliance that is advocated for cleft use is actually the soldered lingual arch because it's fixed and it doesn't require patient cooperation. The holy retainer is a removable appliance and you have to depend on the patient to wear it. So what are our challenges? What are our challenges? Very quickly, I know my time is almost up. What are our challenges? Our challenges in this part of the world, lack of awareness or interests, and this often results in late presentation or poor and poor compliance from these patients. Financial constraints of the patients. A lot a lots of the patients that present actually are from poor socioeconomic backgrounds. And even if treatment is free, sometimes just having the money to come in for their regular visits. I must add that orthodontic treatment is quite intensive, so it requires the patient coming in every few weeks. Can be a burden for these patients and their parents. The availability of um, materials and lab services is improving thanks to Smile Train, little by little. But we do have, we still have a problem with the lack of dedicated manpower and services. So there aren't enough specialists that are completely dedicated to cleft management. I don't know a single specialist that is doing only clefts at this point in time. Certainly in orthodontics, there are only 60 qualified orthodontics serving a population of 200 million. It's almost impossible to get one that will do just orthodontics. Materials and equipment. Equipment are actually quite expensive. So that's something that can be a bit of a problem for us. Loss of patients to follow up is also ties into the lack of interest of patients. And we still need to work on our standard of care. It's improving, but we still need to get there. So moving forward, what are we going to do? First of all, I think we need to educate our patients especially with orthodontics. I don't think surgery has too much of a problem, but orthodontics is an issue. So we still have to make the patient aware, improve their awareness so that they will come in and follow up on treatment. They should be informed right from birth that this is what, they, this is, what is going to happen throughout the life of their child. So using outreaches, using educational flyers or pamphlets, person-to-person -person information, that is one parent talking to another, having the social worker talk to a, um, a new mother of a cleft child, 
all these ones will go a long way to improving the patient's knowledge. Continued manpower training. We're not going to get enough. Things change every year. So we need to continue to improve our skills. Now the creation of regional centers, therefore providing region wide comprehensive cleft centers, cleft care is something that we should take into consideration. Looking at the UK who shrunk down their um, 57 centers to eight to 15 centers, just to ensure that the specialists that are carrying out this cleft care are doing the best, are getting the most experience. Continued monitoring and evaluation of patients. So we don't treat and leave, we treat and make sure we hang on to them and we keep contact, call them in regularly, even if they're not ready for treatment. And then much as we are grateful to Smile Train and we always will be, we know that Smile Train won't be with us forever. So where is the future funding going to come from? The government, philanthropic bodies, we need to think. So, in conclusion, comprehensive management of the cleft lip and palate patient requires the input of the whole cleft team. The role of the orthodontist stands from birth to adulthood and involves monitoring of facial growth and correction of prevailing malocclusion at different stages of dental development. There's a need to increase the awareness of orthodontic treatment and its benefits among patients with this deformity in this region. Okay, basically, I just want to say thank you to Smile Train. Smile Train has gone a long way to ensuring uh, that manpower, we, we undergo manpower training. They have also ensured that we are adequately funded to at least start the basic requirements for cleft team management of the patient and i especially want to thank say thank you for teaching us how to fish rather than giving us fish that you have trained us to look after our own people and this is something that i requested when i went to an international conference many years ago you haven't come to just help and leave but you've come to ensure that you leave manpower on the ground the Louf Clef team, we give them thanks. Um, you've created an enabling environment and I get to see the patients that I've always wanted to see. And it continues to expand daily. Kudos to our coordinator, Professor Mulewe. And last but not least, Professor Puneet Batra, who has been into the country twice in a year to ensure that we undergo training. So he has trained a large number of orthodontics in the orthodontic management of cleft patients, of the cleft patients. So, these are my references, some of them, by no means all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dacosta, for a very detailed presentation. I will now take some questions from the chat room. Are you, are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah, right. So I have some questions from the chat room for you. The okay. first one is that, is there any difference between deep bite and mandibular overclosure? And the second one is how often is strapping supposed to be changed? And the third one is, how? is, there possible, is it possible to train an orthodontic nurse? Okay, so I heard clearly was, I could only hear the first one because there's a generator running here. Um, All right. The first one was, is there any difference between deep bite and mandibular overclosure? It is the maxillary, pre-maxillary overgrowth that actually causes the deep bite. So yes, there's a difference between it, but it does cause it. All right. A patient can have a deep bite without having maxillary overgrowth. The second question is, what, how often is strapping supposed to be changed? The trapping is supposed to be changed as often as, as required in the course of the day because the patient may feed and it may get wet and therefore not adhere properly and then you will change it. 
All right, thank you. So, so as far as it's ineffective, then it needs to be changed. Okay. The third question is that, is it possible to train an, an orthodontic nurse to do what an orthodontist does? I guess things like strapping for sure. Um, cleft, orthodontic cleft management is quite complex. And I don't think I would hand it over to a, an orthodontic nurse to take care of. Possibly if he's all I needed was arch wire change. Yes, that's something that an orthodontic nurse would do. But in terms of diagnosis and drawing up a treatment plan and then executing, no, I wouldn't hand it over to an orthodontic nurse. But yes, they could make it uh, a lot easier by taking off the burden of some of the simpler cases. All right, thank you. The next question is that, is there any age limit for the fabrication of NAM? Is there any age limit for the fabrication of NAM? I can't hear, I can hear the bit about now, but I'm not sure what age it is you're limit, asking. Age limit. Is there age any limit. age oh, limit? Oh, yes. Yeah. No, first, no, you can only do it for the first uh, few months, first two to three months. And ideally, you want to catch a patient for the NAM in the first few weeks. And this is because you are actually dealing with, you want to deal with the patient when they are moldable, when the tissues are not elastic. All right, thank you very much. On palata expanda, there is a question that at what age and how do you prevent prolapse? At what age and? How to avoid prolapse? Relapse can be, um, at what age the expansion is carried out between, uh, expansion is usually carried out between the ages of eight and 11. And the best way to prevent relapse of the expansion is that appliance that I talked to you about. And if you can't make a, a fixed appliance, then you can always use a removable appliance, cause, um, but caution the patient that that appliance must always be in his or her mouth. All right. Then the next question is, why do you wait till cleft lip is five millimeter before incorporating the NASA stent. Say again. Why do you wait till cleft lip is five mm before incorporating the NASA stent? The width of the cleft, basically we're doing one stage before another. Basically you're doing one stage before another. So we deal with the intraoral stage first before we go on to deal with the nasal stage because you need to incorporate the nasal stent after you have finished achieving the, the approximation of the arch segments. I didn't talk about um, GPP, gingival perioosteoplasty, but some patients actually undergo gingival um, perioosteoplasty at this stage. It's a controversial technique, but some patients do undergo it. So that is done first, and then you deal with the molding of the nose. Thank you. Another question is that, can you give more explanation on decompensation, the first stage of pre-surgical orthodontics? More explanation on decompensation. And the first stage of... Well, what normally happens... Okay, what normally happens when... Um, a patient has a skeletal defect um, discrepancy is that the teeth now try to compensate for that discrepancy. So what you often see is proclination of the upper incisors and retroclination in the, low of lo the lower incisors like in a case of um, class three. Now, your job prior to surgery, since surgery is going to carry, be carried out, is to remove those compensations that have occurred naturally so that the patient has the incisors at the optimal inclination because you are the patient is already under, going to undergo surgery thank you very much other question other question other question some patients some I want to know what is your preferred maximum age to commence PSIO is what you call 
Hello. What's your Hello. preferred maximum age to commence PSIO? Maximum. Maximum. Probably two maximum months. Maximum age, yeah, to commence. Probably two months. Probably two months. Two months. Maybe okay. three tops. But I would prefer the patient comes within the first couple of weeks. Then another question is that during distraction of the genesis procedure, is it necessary to open up the bite? It, are we talking during distraction of the genesis? Extra oral or extra oral distraction? Because if it's extra oral, actually what happens is if it's intra oral, actually what happens is moving the distractor horizontally. We're not moving it downwards. So we actually have to put in that vertical vest vector using elastics. So no, there's not a need to open up the bite. Another question is that does NAM therapy has any effect on the need for secondary alveolar bone graft? Well, I've already mentioned that NAM has no long-term effect, except for on the nose, so no. So the last question is that, do you advise, do you advise your correction over correction when carrying out a distraction of genesis in order to compensate for relapse, if any? Also, from your experience, you recommend removal of all brackets appliances in between pre and post surgical orthodontics. Why do I advise the removal of all brackets for what? The first one is that do you advise over correction? In due? yes, I do. Yes, I do. All right, not excessive. Okay, the yes. next question is that do you recommend removal of all brackets appliances in between pre and post surgical orthodontics? No, the brackets stay on. What you use is a rigid arch wire, but the brackets stay on. So once again, I want to say thank you for this beautiful presentation and questions and uh, answers. And then I hand over to Esther to conclude this session. Thank you very much. Esther, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Debola. Thank you so much, Professor Da Costa, for that wonderful presentation on the possibilities of orthodontics and improving our patients' outcomes as we continue to focus on comprehensive cleft care for our children. I would like to invite all of us again here tomorrow. Thank you for taking part in the poll. That, uh, that was impromptu just to fill the gap but it is also useful for us to know that we have a lot of people who are joining our lectures each and every time. Welcome tomorrow, same time, same place, same link, and invite your friends and colleagues. Have a wonderful afternoon.